Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and in almost every generation, there are entertainers, singers, writers, poets, who are able to not only thrill us with their performances, but in some way they become the prophets of our time. And we listen to them and we learn their lyrics and we memorize their melodies and we sing their songs. And in some way, they not only enrich us, but they help us with a sense of vision. And so when I was growing up now, two generations ago, uh, the person who represented so much of the idealism in the world of music was somebody like a Bob Dylan, who wrote lyrics and simple melodies that have become classics. And then the next generation was sort of the Paul Simons. So from blowing in the wind to sounds of silence, there was a sense that we were with unusual people who helped us grow ourselves. And we have now, in this generation, a young and yet extremely competent, professional, marvelous entertainer who also writes with passion and with insight that stirs the soul. And he does this from within a Jewish context. And his music is, I think it's fair to say, a blend of sort of rap and um, sort of some Bob Marley as well as some Chazanut and a bit of Shlomo Karlbach. And when you put it all together, you have the extraordinary talent of Matis Yahu, who is kind enough, after just coming off a stage here in Stamford, Connecticut, live at five, where you were thrilling, you're kind enough now to sit with me, and I appreciate it very much. Thank you for giving us a moment. Thank you. So I'm interested in talking about two things to the extent to which you're comfortable doing so. One is you as, the, you know, as somebody who's had a unique and fascinating Jewish journey of yourself, of your own, and then your music, which is also um, fascinating to me. In this world of stress, obstacles and tests, oh, I will do my best and leave the next one for my best. With the devil, tread the phone of people, living like a rebel, want to revel in the treble. Well, you jump another level, yeah, you want to get high, but don't want to pay the price, want to slice through the night. Sit back, feel nice, carry snakes around your neck, call back and get gone to the light from the dawn. Shine you want to say, I grow up with the sounds of George Gershwin, not a modest Yahoo sound, and even Bob Marley for me is much later. When you grew up, and you grew up in White Plains, New York. When you grow up in White Plains, New York, what's the music in your ear? Oh, um, I listened to, to some of the music you mentioned before. Uh, my parents are, had good taste in music, Paul Simon, Bob Dylan, Neil Young, Crosby, Stills, Nash, that kind of stuff. Um, and then uh, listened to, um, as a kid, Michael Jackson and um, and then, uh, you know, as I started getting, uh, you know, listening to the radio, whatever, you know, what was on in those days. And then I guess when I was about um, 14, you know, 12, 13, 14, that's when hip hop was starting to get really, you know, really big in yeah. the, um, you know, early 90s, I guess. Um, so there was a lot of that. And then, uh, then I, you know, found reggae music. I got exposed to that and got into that. And then I was into, uh, got into, you know, the band Fish. Uh, improvisational music yes. and that kind of such so uh, I grew up listening to a lot of different types of music. At what point do you know you love music and want to make it your life? Uh, from from a young young age um, like I knew that's what I wanted to do. I was really? performing and you know putting on shows and doing raps and, and that kind of stuff probably from the time I was maybe six or seven and then um, and then my other love at that age was ice hockey. I played ice hockey. So uh, at a certain point, you know, I wanted to dedicate myself <laughs> to hockey or uh, acting. I always loved acting. And um, I took theater classes at SUNY Purchase and such. So 
um, I was into that performing, but music became my real kind of passion, my real love, uh, a love that was really just for for me, for nobody else. You know, it wasn't about uh, anything besides the feeling that the music was giving me when I would listen, and the words and what it would do for me as a as an adolescent and a teenager. So, um, music became the, the really the thing that became sort of like my best friend, you know? Were your parents encouraging? Well, you know, my parents were encouraging in the sense that they wanted me to, they wanted me to pursue, you know, my mom always was, you know, like me to acting and, you know, my, they loved seeing me in plays and choruses and that kind of stuff. Once it became more on my own terms, you know what I mean? Once I got into listening to Bob Marley and all of the things that went along with that, mm -hmm. so, there wasn't as much of an understanding there, you know, and uh, there was a lot of fear with all those kind of things. But uh, today, my parents are very supportive. They come to the shows, and yes, they. Uh, I think they they love it. Yes, I had the privilege of meeting your mother and father, who are lovely and obviously very proud of you. When you say fear, did the kind of music you like create a distance between you and your parents? No, it was more the drug associations with the music. I you see, because the music had the drug association with it, so. You know, that's what came along with that. Okay. Anybody who reads about you understands that you had an unusual teenage years. Mm. And at what point, my understanding is, you leave high school, you are involved in the drug culture. Is that fair to say? Mm hmm Okay. And at some point, you end up in Israel. Oh, I know well, that... No, it's the opposite way. No. Help me. It, in, and when I was 16, I went on an Alexander Muss trip to, to mm -hmm. Israel. And there are high school in Israel? There are high school in Israel, American high school where kids go for three, four months, you know, and you see the land, you learn about the land, and that was an amazing experience. That and, was and my first trip to and Israel. And how, how did you end up on that trip? That trip was, um, I was in Hebrew school, I went to Hebrew school growing up, and uh, someone came and spoke about it and said there was a trip, you could go and you could miss a you know a semester of school or high school and right. go to Israel so I remember you know I remember telling everybody I'm going on that trip and everybody <laughs> laughed at me because I was like the furthest thing from Judaism you know mm -hmm. I was not into it I was there because I had to be there but so I was like I'm going to Israel that's what I want that's do. interesting were your parents into Israel with which is a my Zionist home my parents before I was born made a went to make Aliyah in Israel and then that's a funny story. They didn't, they weren't really meeting people. They weren't really loving it. And then they didn't have enough money to get back. They want to come back. And uh, so they had the only thing they had, they had their records. They had all these records, which they had shipped over and Grateful Dead and Bob Dylan and all those records. And so they started, they had to sell them to get money to get back. So they started doing these sales on the street. And, and then they started meeting all these people and talking about the music and all that. And then they didn't want to leave. But they did. They went, they came back. And I grew up. In New York, so mm -hmm. you go, and what happens to you? So I went to Israel. I got, you know, I, re I really, I, I really think it started, you know, really for me that summer. I was 16. I went on a, like a wilderness expedition type trip, and that that was like the first time I think being solitary in nature, being alone in the wilderness, and that really started to open up a sort of like a gap, a hole inside of me that I felt um, maybe for the first time, or I started feeling this. You know, I, I wouldn't call it God. When you think of, you know, you know, having an in, interaction with God, you think of something like filling you. This was more the opposite. It was sort of like a, a gaping hole. And that was the first time I, I remember feeling that and wanting to fill that hole with God, you know, with prayer or with the idea that I was not alone, that actually there was a, um, a partner in life for me and, and someone watching over me. So... And then I went to Israel that fall, which was prime time. And, and this is a time for me, musically, I'm really getting into Bob Marley and all of that. And I have the dreadlocks and the counterculture and all of that. So um, I was into that. And then Israel was sort of like this split for me. It was like a, I could go either way. You know, I mean, at that point, it was, it was so true because there was girls that it was, you know, it was the first time away from home and you're in a dorm and there's tons of girls. And, and you know you can smoke cigarettes there no problem you can drink well you're not you weren't supposed to but you could go and drink and what about drugs Dr drugs at that point were harder to get in Israel okay. it was much easier to get drugs in the states at that point uh -huh. 
um, but um, at least for a 16 year old American kid, uh -huh. I don't know. But yeah, but the second night I was in Israel, we went out, we all went to Tel Aviv, and uh, someone got caught drinking, and I was almost thrown off the trip the second day. I mean, they were going to throw me off, I was that close, and they you know, had they had I been thrown over, that could have changed everything for me. You know, who knows? You know, like what a, what a it so would change your whole life. They kept me. They kept me there. I was grounded for for a month or <laughs> three weeks or whatever it was. But I stayed there, and and that was that was really when I started to see the imagery of what, when Judaism opened the whole. You know, it's what happens to every American Jewish kid that goes there. It's like it just wow, everything opens up. You see that Judaism is not necessarily you know. The, the place where you grew up, the JCC that you grew up in, having to go to Hebrew school on Sunday morning or whatever, that Judaism is taxi drivers and it's a whole country and it's a, you know, and, and the old city and it's, it's, it's everything. And um, so I started seeing all this spiritual imagery there. And as I was writing, I started, was writing rhymes and raps and stuff. And then I started, that was really when I started incorporating in the, um, the Jewish imagery into my lyrics and stuff like that. And, and because I was listening to Bob Marley and reggae music, so that was sort of my influence in terms of incorporating Old Testament lyrics into music. So, you know, listening to Bob Marley and then his like successors like Sizzla and Capleton and Buju Bantan, and these guys are like what was called conscious reggae, and, and, uh, and all the, the lyrics are, you know, there is a certain majestic quality to, to the, uh, the way in which they would quote the Bible that I had never connected with before so that there was that going on as well so um, it's just sort of coming together for me and then I'm in Israel and then when I came home from Israel I sort of struggled a little bit having being back in in you know I, I felt I guess I felt sort of isolated and I in that I was really like starting to go on to this this journey and it was not where everyone else around me was and uh, you know and then I, I didn't have I was just sort of developing my voice, you know. You, you know, I didn't my the, the music component and all that. And and um, anyway, so it wasn't until the the following then the following first year of my senior year. So that was junior year, my senior year that I left home and uh, and went out on the road. You really did find your own way, didn't you? So I started to explore Judaism on my own terms, you know, which is what hopefully every young Jewish kid will do at some point they'll be faced with a question of their identity and who they are and everyone will approach it in a different way as you know as it feels right for that person and because I had a certain spiritual longing and because I had the sort of the creative backdrop of the music with the Old Testament and all that um, that's what sent me kind of going I guess in that direction. Fascinating. Fascinating. But, yeah, but at that point I didn't take Judaism seriously I still really as a religion it was more just a it was bubbling. It was like bubbling, you know. Okay, you. When you grew up, you grew up in a Reconstruction synagogue. Yeah. Now you're roughly at the end of your high school career. You're 17, 18 years old, yeah. and there is a certain sense of I want to find this for myself. Where do you go? What do you do? It, what, it wasn't like everything was jolly and great, and I was just like, I'm going to go explore the world now with a Ziploc baggie full of quarters in my pocket. I mean. It was a, what drew, what brought me to that point was a lot of turmoil and a lot of tension that I needed to just break away from. Okay. And the music to me was the release from that. That was my that was my what I felt to be my destiny. What I felt was where that was where I felt, you know, I guess I felt love in that music, you know, and uh, and I felt you know, beauty in it. So that was what I, that was what I went, you know, was searching for, that was what I, what I went after. What was it that drew you into the traditional Jewish world as an outlet for who you are and what you're trying to do both with the music and the words? Again, it was the same thing that sort of turned me on, I think, uh, that, that got me interested in God in the first place. I'm 20, you know, whatever it is, 20 years old, 21. And you know, I've I've tried music, I've tried drugs, I've tried a lot of different things to, you know, to expand the mind and and um, to and feel, to fill the hole, to feel and well, you know, and um, and then uh, then I basically just tried Judaism, you know. I mean, I basically 
I w the way it started was I started praying. I started praying. I got a prayer book from that rabbi, Les, my Reconstructionist rabbi. I went to home. I was home. I got a prayer book. And um, a talus. I had a talus from my dad that my grandfather had. And I would just basically go on the roof after school. I was at the new school. So I'd go up, on, I'd go up the uh, fire escape up onto the roof where I, would, where at one point, used to smoke blunts. And instead, I put on my talus and I, I opened up the prayer book and I started praying. I was praying to God for, for, um, you know, for me to find the music, for me to find a way to do the music. I was praying for, um, for happiness and for uh, love, you know. And um, and that's how I. That was my first step into it. And then, you know, then there were so many things. There were so many different things along the way that moved me in one direction or another direction, but eventually I found myself in Yeshiva in Crown Heights. Okay. One of the places I saw that you ended up was a place that I grew up in. You were at the Karlbach Synagogue on 79th, just west of West End Avenue. What did that mean for you? What did you find there? That, that was an awesome, awesome place. And um, that was... Uh, that same around that same time, I was in school. I was about twenty, and um, I was searching now. So I was looking. I went to B'nai Jeshuin. I tried. You know, I went to different shuls. I went. I would go around and go out to Flatbush, and I'd follow this person or that person. And one, then one night, and I, now I don't know if this is how I got there. I met a guy. Okay, the guy's name is Ru Ruben, Ruben Roy. He's kind of a mystery. He he's sort of like a Upper West Side mystic um, and um, we met and, and it was late and I was fascinated by him and we started talking and um, we were sitting on the bench and so he was going to Karlbach and I knew I was actually on my way there that there's a, a, a Mariv minion at 10 p.m. it was like a Tuesday or a Wednesday night or something so like I went I went with him we went, went into the shul I love the shul I got a great feeling right when I walked in that was just a Mariv, like a regular Mariv. So I went back Friday night, and then Friday night I saw what happens at Karbach Shul, singing the music. And um, I started going every week, pretty much, you know, or yeah. religiously. I would take the train there, and I would get a slice of pepperoni pizza after, but I would, I would go there like if I was late. I remember one time I was on the other side, I was on the east side, and like I knew where the minion was starting now. I was so excited about Judaism, as, you know, as it was starting, I was so excited about it, and I, I remember running, like running full speed, in the rain, through the park, diagonally <laughs> through the park, straight to 79th Street to the to the shul, you know, and getting there like in the middle of of the davening, and sweating and, <laughs> and wet from the rain, and you know, it was a that was a beautiful beautiful place well, uh, uh, and, uh, and the story about that guy yeah. so I still see him you know I see him all the time he, he and uh, one time so I hadn't seen him in years you know but every time I see him he, the, guy, the guy knocks my socks off like I, I really feel he's one of the 36 and um, and uh, at one time we were on our way to the MTV Woody Awards in a limo you know this was already after things had kind of gotten big with King Without a Crown and everything and and uh, we're going to the awards, and I was going to perform. It's got a big, de big deal on TV, and everyone's in the car, everyone's in the limo, and we're driving, and all of a sudden I look out the window, and there no. he is, you know. He's, <laughs> and I jumped out of the limo, and I told the limo to go without me. I needed to see him, and we we walked together, you know, the last 15 blocks That's or whatever lovely. to the That's a lovely to story. the awards, you know. You have to explain. You you developed your own distinctive persona but one of the things it was it had a very orthodox look and you had a beard and you tended to wear black at one point and I you know I write what you write what you wrote what you tweeted and what was on your blog but at one point you make a decision you're gonna shave off the beard and even now when you perform tonight it was a very different look I need you to explain to us You've tried to say this is not a rejection in any way of your Jewishness or Judaism. But explain, what was it, Maras Yahu, that made you say, okay, 
I want to ex express this love of Jewishness in a different form, which is the form you are now. You know, I think it's just there, it's exactly that. There's different forms, there's different expressions, and why should a person be, you know, locked into one expression for whatever, whatever it is, whatever, if it's your look, if it's your ideology, if it's your religion, why should you be locked into one form your whole life? I think people get trapped into that. They are, people are afraid once they're in the flow of something to change or to look outside of that. Now, for me, I'm always looking, you know, wherever I am, you know. There was a time I tried to look less, you know, I tried to, I tried to be, to be more just accepting of, of what it is that I was giving myself to. But sooner or later, that guy like, is going to come out. That's who I am. It's my nature to constantly look for what's real, what's moving me, and what's, you know. It, when, I, when I do something that's not real, it hurts me. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like uh, if I have to answer a question, and, I, you know, and, it, and it's posed in a way that I have to say something that doesn't feel right, that could set me off for an hour, you mm -hmm. know, or two. You know, mm -hmm. I, I mean, it breaks me up. I don't like being in that situation. So if you're, if I'm in a situation where I'm, you know, doing all the things that might come along with with Judaism, with Orthodox Judaism, and the rules and all of that, and not feeling not feeling any you know connection there, now I worked at it a decade, you know, and I got a lot from it. I I, I learned a lot about um, myself, about Judaism, and about the world, you know, through through my exploration and through really delving into the books and the life, full force, you know. I mean, um, I don't, not many people go to that extreme, you know, but I felt that that was the way to get to the core of it, was to go all the way with it. But it nev never in my life did I ever say that this is what I'm going to be for the rest of my life. And if you looked at a picture of me from when I was 12 to when I was 17, and then when I was 17 to 21, and then 21, to, to uh, 24 and then 24 to now, you know, you're going to see changes, a lot of them, and um, that's just the way I am. Do you consider yourself still an Orthodox Jew? I don't, I mean, I guess to some, I do probably if I'm thinking to myself, I think of myself as an Orthodox Jew, but um, in some ways, I mean, I, I just don't feel the need at all to classify myself mm -hmm. as, as Orthodox, as, as conservative, as anything. At one point, you would not have performed on Shabbat. Is that still true? That is still true, yeah. Okay. So I told you before, your music isn't my music. But there is one Manas Yahu song which I adore. And that is One Day. I adore the words. They make me cry. And I love the melody. And the refrain about all my life I've been waiting for and been praying for and there will be no war, and our children will play. Is there anything you can tell me about your memory of how those words and music come together for you in that specific refrain of one day? It is a brilliant, brilliant, it, for me, it's with blowing in the wind and sounds of silence, it is a classic. Okay. How did it happen? Um, okay, so first I would like to say that uh, Two, I would like to say two things about what you said. One is, one is the song was co-written. The melody and the uh, lyrics were co-written between a few people, one of whom is Bruno Mars, a very famous pop singer. At the time, he had not yet, you know, broken. So, um, so he, he really contributed a lot to that song, as well as uh, another, another guy, Philip. The, their production team was called the Smeezingtons, and they, they co-wrote that song with me. But I had a thought uh, two nights ago when I was singing this song, and you know, like as you said before, you're you're into acting. You understand the performance aspect to it. So, you know, not every time when you perform, when you're singing something, can you can it, can you be emoting? That's correct. And um, so the other night I was singing one day, and I was not feeling good at all. Um, just about you know, I just felt just, there was something not going right, something not going on right with me, whatever it was. And uh, the lyrics and the words, you know, I was just getting through it and just pushing myself through it just to end the show, really. And then I, I saw like some people out there in the audience singing the song, and I saw how you know passionate and um, how into it they were, and I started thinking about all the stories that I've heard about that particular song, and about people um, that have had amazing triumphs and and have had amazing um, experiences with that song, 
and uh, basically, uh, you know, my realization in that moment was, which, which I've thought before, but I never felt to that extent, was, um, this, you know, the song means, you know, people give the song meaning. People put their meaning into the song. They infuse the song with meaning. And now I go out and I'll sing a new song, let's say, like, uh, like, um, like wo Live Like a Warrior, which mm -hmm. I feel will, will be as big, if mm -hmm. not bigger, than one day. Mm -hmm. And, and I see it's like a baby. It's like the stories aren't there yet. You know what I mean? I sing the song, and people are singing the lyrics, and you could, there aren't so many. There isn't so much history. There isn't so much meaning embedded into it yet. Even you know, it doesn't matter what I. It does to some extent what I thought or what I feel when I'm making. But at a certain point, it becomes something else. And one day is is that kind of song. Well, it's an extraordinary gift. You're a gift, Manas Yahu. Thank you for the time. Thank you. I can't tell you how really thrilling it is for me to meet with you. And I Thank wish you kol tuv You should only know success and happiness in everything you do. And I hope every now and then you'll just find the time to spend a few moments with me. But all the best to you. You're really wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. And that was my meeting with Manas Yahu, who is one of, if not, the leading performers in the world Jewish community today. I hope you enjoyed meeting him. And I'd also love you to know that Marat Yahoo's new album, Spark Seeker, is now available. You can find it at maratyahooworld.com or on iTunes. Of course, as always, I'd love to hear any thoughts you have to the ideas expressed by Marat Yahoo. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, and tweet me. I look forward to hearing from many of you. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to Jam, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support. L'chaim is a presentation of Jewish Education in Media. <laughs>